Hey everybody, welcome to the Video Craft Show presented by Video Husky. I am your host, John Santiago, and in this episode of the program, I am talking with Brian Medeiros. Now, he is the creative brains behind the YouTube channel Nacho Average Finds. It's a channel that he started in 2017 with his brother Nacho as a love letter to sneaker culture. And their content has evolved over time, and these days they're really known for these high quality documentary deep dives into the history of some of the world's most iconic sneakers. So in this episode, Brian and I have a wide ranging conversation about a variety of subjects, including the origins of his channel, as well as the challenges involved with creative work. You don't want to miss this. So stay tuned. You're locked in to the video craft show presented by Video Husky. So I, I kind of want to start with you um, just in terms of the idea for your channel. Obviously, like you and your brother are huge sneaker heads. Tell me yeah. about where like your passion for and your interest for um, kicks really began. So, uh, so basically, I didn't have a passion for kicks before starting this channel, to be 100% honest with you. I grew up skateboarding in Fresno, like you know, and uh, so we, I, I went to school for music, and I was really into music, and I wanted to pursue music as a career, and it just wasn't going anywhere, and uh, I bought a um, a camera to do like photography, because I was just trying to divert my interest from music, because I was just so sick of it, and. Uh, I bought the camera and it was, it's like a crop sensor. So what that means is like the, like when you zoom out the most on the camera, it's still zoomed in by like 80 millimeters. So it's not the best for photography. It's meant for video. Right. And it took me like some trial and error to figure that out. But once I figured out that it's for video, I said, damn, I should do something with this. Right. So I was watching video on YouTube one day. And, uh, and it just clicked. I was like, damn, my brother has this weird obsession with shoes, specifically going to Ross and Burlington and all these discount retailers trying to find deals. And I was like, what if I just like used him as a guinea pig and started, you know, filming him and, uh, and I could like learn how to edit and it could just be this whole journey, new journey that has nothing to do with music. Cause I'm so sick of music. And that's what we did. And, uh, yeah, it, at first it was kind of just like a joke, but then it started to take off. And, uh, and the more and more I did it, the more I started to get like the sneaker bug. I was like, damn, sneakers are cool. Shoes are cool. I liked shoes before when I was a skateboarder growing up in Fresno, I, I liked skate shoes and stuff, but not, I didn't really, really appreciate like the stories behind them, what made them iconic, like the materials and just every, there's so much that goes into a, a shoe design and so much storytelling specifically with like Nike shoes. And, uh, I just was like, I just caught the bug that way. My brother has always been into sneakers. He's been into sneakers for the past, uh, I mean, he's 34, I think. So since like maybe he was 10 or something. And uh, for me, it's really been like the past three years. So that's how, that's how I got the sneaker bug. And my brother's just always had it growing up, you know. Gotcha. So it's it was really just an exper. Your channel was just kind of this experiment for yourself to kind of dabble, I guess, with video production as you were moving away from from music, right? So everything, so everything you did was like self taught then. Yeah, everything was you know like I remember the first video I watched on YouTube was called, you know, how to edit on Adobe Premiere in tw like in twenty minutes or something like that, and I just was like it was just it became addictive like I don't I don't know if you can relate but when you start learning like a new program or just anything new you just want to learn more and more about it and you want to master it and I've always been like very obsessive and very like when I get into something I get into it pretty extreme and uh it just it was just kind of like a rabbit hole video editing and uh I even made another YouTube channel with my other brother who has the passion for cooking and barbecuing and I was like let's just do and I, and I was too insecure to make my own channel. I eventually did, but I just turned the camera on to my brother. So I made like cooking videos with my brother. I made 
the sneaker videos with my brother. It really just became like, yes, yeah, so I had to self, I, there was no way, I went to school for music and there was no way I was gonna go back to college for videography or for photography or something like that. I just had to teach myself. And through teaching myself, I've really gained a lot of, um, a lot of appreciation for like other YouTubers and film and sneakers, like I said, and uh, it's really been a, it's been a good like four years now of just like trying to improve constantly every video, you know? And uh, you know, and that literally just starts with like going to YouTube and be like, like uh, how do you, how do you make the audio sound clean on a, uh, on a, on a video or how do you, you know, it just, it definitely self-taught hundred percent. And, um, uh, it's, it's amazing. I love it. I, it's like an, an obsession to teach yourself constantly. It doesn't even matter if it's video editing, anything. Where, where does that come from for you personally? That you, you, that's something that's just, you've always kind of had your entire life, just this desire to teach yourself things. Yeah, for sure. Uh, since I was a kid, I think skateboarding had a lot to do with it. Uh, I'm right now I'm working on a video on the uh, the rise of uh, do you know DC Shoes? Yeah, of course. So they're a very iconic brand and they have a lot of history and uh, and I, I'm working on a hit. Uh, I don't know if you've seen our videos on YouTube, uh, but we do a lot of like sneaker history videos and I want to do one on. Um, on the history of DC. So I've been studying it and I've been like getting closer and closer to like my childhood and reliving these skateboarding moments. And I realized as I was watching this, that s skaters, uh, if you've ever seen a skater in the street or if you've ever skateboarded yourself, you can relate to, uh, just instant failure, right? So, cause you're like trying this trick and you're trying to learn this trick and you're falling and you're falling and it's painful and you're falling and it's over and over and you're obsessed with getting it right. And you'll even land the trick sometimes. And even after you land it, it's not like the way you want it, right? So you have to um, do it over and over and, and it's kind of obsessive. Like I know, I know uh, there's a pro skater named Andrew Reynolds. Um, he taps his board like three times. Like he on the tail of the board, he'll go like one, two, three before he like does this trick because he just has like OCD. Like he doesn't think he's going to land this trick. And I think it really stems from from like, I think it's becoming more and more clear to me that it stems from, from uh, being a kid skateboarding and just having to have things perfect before going for a trick, you know, and uh, just being obsessive. Like I've always been obsessive. Like I, I won't, I won't drink, you know, alcohol because I know what that's gonna lead to if I like, ooh, get into like whiskey or I get into craft beers, like <laughs> because I know I'll just get obsessed with it and. You know, alcoholism isn't al alcoholism isn't a uh, is just the worst thing ever. So I I don't drink at all, zero, because that's my personality. You know. <laughs> gotcha. If that makes sense. Yeah. So I'm just like obsessive by nature. Always have been since I was a kid. Yeah, it's it seems like something that could be both a gift and a curse, right? Because you can get really really good at something, but then like you said, if you get obsessed about the wrong thing, it could lead to negative consequences but like in creative stuff like this making videos or even when you you did music like that kind of obsession is really super useful to have in order to get good at this yeah for sure i get people who ask me like uh well i, I mean i'm trying to sound like i'm a big shot but i'm not i'll get like co-workers or friends who ask me like yo how do you do youtube videos or how, how the hell did you get ninety thousand subscribers like i want to do that I can do that. And I'm like, yeah, you can. And I like kind of lay it out for them and they never start or they start then they get frustrated because it's too hard. And, uh, and it's because they don't, I mean, I don't, everybody has their own reasons, but f the reason it worked for me is because I have this like burning desire to like solve this creative problem. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm going to like go to sleep at two in the morning, I got to figure it out. And, uh, and I think that's, um, it's definitely a, a good uh, skill to have or a good uh, tendency or gene, I guess, to to have if you want to be doing creative work. You know, you got to be obsessive. If you're not obsessive, uh, if you don't feel like you love it, like if it doesn't bring you, ha the process doesn't bring you like 
happiness or it doesn't feel like you got to be you got to be obsessive right if you want to be successful in something i think personally yeah yeah I, i've <laughs> i've dealt with that myself in the past i think when i've done other things in my career where i was more focused on the end result and not necessarily on the process to get there it just would it just wouldn't be that enjoyable for me, like the ride to get to where I want it to be. And then once you get to the result, you're kind of like, okay, now I have to do it over again. And you're, yeah. and, and if you're not, if you don't enjoy doing it over and over and over again, then it's just going to be really difficult and hard for you to, to stay consistent. Oh, I'm, one, I'm curious to know, sorry to interrupt. I'm curious to know if you can relate to like a cycle that you're in. Like for me, there's definitely like a cycle for, in a cre in the creative process, especially for 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 I guess for anybody who makes videos, you got to research it, you got to script it, you got to film it, you got to edit it, and then upload it. And but it's like it doesn't it's not like it doesn't just go straight up. It's not like a graph that just goes up. Like you got as soon as like I upload, there's like this serotonin release on the day that we upload the video, and it gets all these views, and we get comments, and then and then it's like now what, right? And uh, it's very, very, very hard to get started again. It's really hard. Like sometimes it's uh, it's pretty aimless. Like you'll find yourself, I'll find myself personally like just ignoring it. I'll like clean the house. I'll cook. I'll do everything else except for like that sit in front of the blank page because it's so hard to uh, to get, get started, you know. And uh, it's definitely like a, something that I'm working on constantly. I'm trying to figure out how to, uh, how to not like arrive at that, like dreadful place where you're starting over, um, after I guess climbing the mountain and then you're in front of another mountain. And, uh, I don't know. I was wondering if you could relate to that in your own work or in your own life. Yeah, I can, man, for sure. I mean, I, uh, I'd recommend like a book that really, um, encapsulates what you're talking about really well is is it's this book called the war of art by stephen pressfield have you heard of this book uh i've read it i've he's like constantly uh you know i've, I've read a lot of seth godin and so he's like seth godin's like favorite yeah yeah and uh and ryan holiday has quoted him several times and i know his name and it's bounced around and i've always like wanted to read that book but i just never I never got around to it. At some point, I, I got so busy with this YouTube shit that I stopped reading. Yeah. Yeah. I was, like, listening to audiobooks uh, on my commutes to uh, my day job. And um, ever since COVID happened, like, I, I'm not I'm not getting on the on the city bus or I'm not, you know what I mean? So we're in a, driving in the car now, so I'm not really listening to podcasts or uh or audiobooks as much as I used to, but I've been meaning to, to, I know Stephen Pressfield is like really respected. Yeah. But uh, he's the guy who wrote, he wrote like the legend of Bagger Vance, which got turned into a movie. There was another thing he wrote also, I think that got optioned into a movie. I'm not sure, but I mean, he talks about this concept of the resistance, which it is exactly what you're discussing with the creative process where, you kind of just do everything except the work itself because you're afraid of or your ego or something is afraid of 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 not being able to create something that's worthy of attention, I guess. And yeah, I deal with that, too. I mean, especially I write a lot um, and this is my first foray in a in a while, actually, with video. So um and this is going to be a different process than writing, but somewhat similar in terms of producing it and trying to tell stories here. Um, but yeah, with writing, I always feel that way a lot too, where, you know, you kind of have an idea and then you sit down and then you, you, you start to try and put the information on the page, but you struggle to find the words to to that capture what you're feeling or what you what you want to convey like the ideas that you want to convey and it can be it can be pretty frustrating and yeah it's difficult to kind of um to start over 
over and over again. But I think once you realize that you need to accept that, accept that as part of the process and understand that you're just going to feel that way, it, it, uh, it, it, it doesn't make it any less challenging, um, but it makes it, I think, a little bit more bearable of, of a process, I guess. Right. Right. You know, I, I, it's funny. I was just talking to my friend who's also a creative person. He's a musician. And uh, we both love to listen to Gary Vaynerchuk. And I was listening to an interview with Gary and they asked him, I forgot, it, it was about wasting time, right? Uh, and they told him, uh, they asked him like, uh, I think they asked him like, do, do you feel like you wasted your time as a Jets fan or something like that? As a New York, big New York Jets fan? Because, you know, the New York Jets suck. And, uh, and he was like, no, like, I, I don't see anything in my life, any minute of my life as a waste of time. Like, he, he said, like, every minute just goes into different buckets. Like, some is escapism, some is, like, working on myself, some is work, some is this, some is that. And when I listen, that really helped me, actually. And I've been trying to implement that into my own thought process. Like, because what happens to me is... Like you're saying, right? You got to accept that part as part of the process. You got to accept the resistance as part of the creative process, right? So now for me, like when I start over or something or when I'm about to write a script and I'm sitting in front of the blank page and I don't do it, like I can forgive myself for escaping a little bit or for, you know, trying to do something else and not think to myself. The problem with me is like if I don't, it, like, Okay, let's say like today I'm going to write the script and then tomorrow I'm going to film it and then after that I'm going to edit it and then after that I'm going to do the thumbnail. I really like get on myself for not like on that day not doing it. And uh and uh and for now and and it makes me anxious to be like, "Damn, I didn't do it that day." You know, and now I've, I have like two days worth of work to do in one day and it just compounds and I just get anxious and I don't get anything done until there's like a due date and I'm like you know, super, uh, on it. But, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, it's definitely okay to not meet your goals that day. Like, because your time wasn't wasted. It was used for, you know, whatever, you know, exercise or feeding yourself or escapism, like some video games or, or whatever, you know? And I think that that's made f for me, e it's made it, easier for me to get started there, there's no like there's no uh self guilt there's no guilt in in not getting started on your uh on your your book or whatever it is you're writing or your script or whatever there's no like damn man i should have started man you know i shouldn't have wasted all this time it, it's more of just like well your time went here and and that's fine and it just makes it it just it makes your mind a little lighter when you go into the process and you actually start writing if that makes any sense yeah yeah i mean it's just i don't know what it is about this <laughs> creative process because you get i mean you even think about it relative to like sports too i mean ironically like you're you know this channel that you guys do you and your brother do nacho average finds a lot of it is focused on sneaker culture kind of is centered around like hoops culture, right? Basketball and oh, whatnot. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's it's a similar experience when in terms of of the game of of basketball. Like you can master these skills and and get really good at at shooting or dribbling or whatnot. But you know, sometimes the results aren't necessarily going to be there. You're not <laughs> there's only one champion, right? And so you could put in all that work and then and then not necessarily see the fruits of your labor like result into anything, um, you know, anything worthwhile in, in some people's opinions. But I guess you have to learn to, yeah, you gotta have to, to, to take both, uh, both the, the good and the bad in all of it. I think like to kind of riff off of what you're talking about with um with just creating and 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 being creative and whatnot is there has to be like i think there has to be an element of 
compassion for yourself. Like you have to be a little bit forgiving when you things don't go according to plan. Cause like you said, the, you have a process of how you make these videos, which I definitely want to touch base with you on, but it's not like every single time you go from point A to point B seamlessly and then point B to C seamlessly. Like there's going to be moments where you're just stuck and it's not, you know, that's not something that you should, you have to learn, I guess, to, to be softer or like easier on yourself when those times happen. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you're not, you're, you're lacking creativity or you're, or you're terrible at you at what you do. I think creative people tend have to have have a tendency to do that. Is like when when like the when like the inspiration isn't flowing or if like the content isn't flowing, creative people have a tendency to uh to to get really um to be really hard on themselves, I guess. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And that's why, you know, you see a lot of musicians and a lot of um artists and stuff who have like mental problems and uh and uh and i just think uh a little bit of uh self-care you know and self-compassion like you're saying goes a long way in terms of not just like being efficient as a creative but in terms of like the quality of the work that you're putting out you know what i mean because if you're just constantly dreading or hating your work and uh and just having like no nothing good to say about your work or yourself uh i think it, it it's unhealthy <laughs> yeah for sure yeah it ends up it ends up like tearing away at you i mean and you can see like historically like anybody who's been creative in the past right before even the technology that we have now when you know with creating videos or doing audio uh writers in the past like how many of them have committed sadly suicide you know because of their own um you know their own negative self-talk and their own negative self-perception about themselves because they're i think there's kind of like this false belief that you have to have that edge in order to have your creativity when in reality you you don't like you can you can be light and and find um find that you're creating good work without being so hard on yourself it's not it's not like the common thing to to believe in because you hear a lot of people say well i had this chip on my shoulder the whole time to you know we like that narrative of like the chip on the shoulder to 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 make good art or to like win a championship in sports or to do anything successful in, in your life. When in reality, you know, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to, you don't have to make it so hard for yourself. You can kind of, in, you can learn to enjoy the ride along the way. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm starting to refine that and it feels amazing. Yeah. To be well, that's good to hear. Honest. Yeah, that's good to hear, man. It's very important to have, especially if you're going to be doing this for the long haul. So so again, let's kind of go back to your, you know, this channel in particular, Nacho Average Finds. You your bro- you have another brother. I did not know this who you started another channel with, as you mentioned with. When did that when did that channel start? Around the same time. Um, it's called Doom Smoke. BBQ, like Doom Smoke Barbecue, uh, and uh, it first started out with just me filming him making like barbecue recipes. He's, he's obsessed with barbecue, like more than anybody I know. He has like stacks of like, you, like you see sneakerheads with like stacks of boxes behind them, all the shoes they have. My brother just has stacks of fucking cookbooks, man, and. Uh, and uh, he's like uh, autistic about it. Like you talk to him, he'll just start rambling about barbecue. So I thought it would be cool to, to you know, capture his his thing. And uh, and it's a lot of work, you know, filming. Anybody who's ever filmed a cooking show or has done a, a cooking YouTube channel will tell you, damn, it's a lot of work, man. Like you gotta, you gotta like, you know, <laughs> film everything. You gotta film, you know, when you smash the spices, you cook the food, you gotta plate it. Then you gotta take pictures for the thumbnail, and then the food's cold by then when you eat it. And you know, with barbecue, you gotta like, 
you got to smoke something four hours, you know. So it's a, it, it, it became like very strenuous to do that and the Not Your Average Fine Sing. And the Not Your Average Fine Sing went viral first and kind of took off first. So I, I prioritized that first. Uh, we still make some cooking videos sometimes just for fun. Like I said, when I was trying to figure out how to get over this hump of getting started, like we were just talking about earlier, I told my brother, I was like, yo, why don't you just like, next time you're cooking dinner, make a video, since you're always cooking gourmet stuff anyway, why don't you just make a video like on your phone or on your camera, send me the footage and I'll edit it real quick and we it won't be too flashy. I won't color grade it. I won't put music or anything. I'll just put like some basic titles. And actually that helped like, cause it gets my juices going and I, it was like a whole new thing, right? So I would edit this video and then I would start on the Notch Average Fine Sings, which is the serious thing. But unfortunately, it never took off. He did have one viral video, though. And uh, it's, a, it's a good video because he, he used to work at Chipotle. And, uh, and he made this video saying, like, yo, I, you know, I quit Chipotle. And, uh, and I'm going to show you how, exactly how they make the food. And he, he like, kind of gave away Chipotle's secrets. And it only got, like a hundred views or something but when the quarantine hits for some reason it got like 200,000 views out of nowhere it just went <laughs> viral I don't know why things go viral man it was so weird but everybody was like commenting on my brother's video like man I love your personality like this is the comfort that I needed during this you know quarantine during this hard time like I wish you were my friend and uh, it was really inspiring so we we tried to turn out more videos and it didn't really work but uh Unfortunately, it's not it's not the biggest uh, project right now. But I think in the future, when I'm able to like do YouTube and everything full time, and have like assistant editors and and assistant videographers, like I'll be able to like also do the the uh, the barbecue thing with my brother because it's very profitable. Believe it or not, yeah. Food food channels are very profitable if you do it correctly. Yeah, I guess it it, it sounds like to me. It's when when lockdown started sweeping the nation that people were missing Chipotle and then maybe went to YouTube and just started looking up Chipotle videos or whatever going on search cuz search on YouTube is just such a powerful function, right? Like it's it's the second I mean, I can correct myself if I'm wrong later on, but YouTube is like the second biggest search engine behind Google which also owns YouTube. So yeah. maybe that was what it was. Um, but I'm curious, I'm, yeah. I'm curious about, tell me about the process of, of making these videos in particular for Nacho Average Finds. Cause this is like, I found you through these, these like documentary type pieces that you've been doing. And it seems like you've been doing, doing these types of pieces for what, like the last year or year and a half or so before that you were doing a lot of like vlog type stuff with your brother going to like as you mentioned like ross burlington coat factory and other places to find um you know rare kicks which kind of it, it was kind of made me laugh because i remember doing that too myself when i was more interested in in, in sneakers back in the day but i'm you really give it up you should go you should do it again man it's like therapy yeah going, to Ross and stuff. <laughs> going well I mean, maybe i feel like I that's an opportunity for you guys to go hit up like tj Ro tj tj Ro tj max ross burlington co factory for potential sponsorship opportunities because that's like a was, untapped yeah. niche for them i i was scared to do that because of like a cease and desist or whatever i wasn't sure like i thought about it i was like man what if like Ross paid us like per video and they just gave us like an empty store and we could do, we could make content. Like, because I mean, at the time when we were filming those videos, like we were showing deals, right? We're like, yo, look at these, uh, you know, at the time I think like Adidas boost technology was like the biggest thing. And we would find like boosts like, yo, look at these ultra boosts for like 70 bucks. And then in the comments, everybody's like, damn, I'm going to go to my Ross right now. I got to go look for that. And it's bringing business to Ross and Burlington and and so it's a definitely you know a leverage point and like an argument to be made if I if I ever was to try to get sponsored by Ross or TJ Maxx 
but uh, I, I think they're just so out of touch with culture, and uh, I just don't think that. I think, I think they would just be like, "Yo, you gotta stop making these videos," because we would get kicked out often from the stories for filming. Like they'd be like, "Yo," well, they would get kicked out, but they'd be like, "Yo, you can't film here." <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> I got a little acid reflux. Um, or. Or we would get kicked, we would t be told not to film, and then we'd come back the next day to film, and then get kicked out again. And uh, <clears throat> I just don't think an endorsement from them would ever happen. They're too, too corporate. Um, but to talk about, to go back to what you were uh, asking about before was like the process of these documentary videos. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the way they started was, I. Uh, so, so Nacho lives, my brother Nacho, he lives in Fresno. Okay, I live in LA, and it's been that way for almost a decade now. And so the way I would film these Ross videos at the time is I would take a, uh, take a Amtrak to Fresno. And almost every weekend, or almost every two weeks, and we would just like stockpile on footage. And then I'd come back here to LA, and then I'd edit it all on my days off for my day job. And that was kind of our, uh, our, our process, but that is impossible to scale, right? Especially when you have a day job, you don't live in the same city. So what I thought to myself was like, how can I make a video myself without my brother that will help us grow on the channel? And so I was like thinking and I'm thinking, I'm scratching my head and I watched like, uh, I started noticing like this trend on YouTube, like explainer videos, right? Like, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of like the YouTube channel Vox. They make these like videos breaking down like, like, like a uh, really complex political situations in the U.S. or wherever, or just like really random, random shit. Like I watched a Vox video called, um, you know, why is granite so popular in America? <laughs> and it was like a five minute video that like had you hooked. Like it was so good. It was like produced really well. And I watched it all the way from the beginning to end. And it was literally about granite, like how granite became so popular in American homes. And uh, I thought to myself, damn, I should make one of these for sneakers, right? So with that in mind, I was like, okay, so, you know, I, I want to make these videos. Where do I start? So I made a, a, a video called The Rise of Champion, you know, the company, the clothing company Champion. And uh, it was basically... So it's basically, this is, and this is the framework for the vi for every video ever since I made that video. Like I, this process hasn't changed. It started with me, just like searching Google for hours on like the history of Champion, and how Champion became popular, and just everything Champion, or Nike or whatever video or sneaker we're doing at the time. And then I would ingest all that information, and then take about a day or two to script it out. And uh, then we would film it with me reading it or my brother. And uh, and then the editing is brutal. Uh, I don't know if you've seen like Vox videos, they have a whole team behind them, right? They've got like all these animations. And, uh, and so that's all me, just one guy. I do all the editing, my brother doesn't edit. And so for like two minutes of video, it took me, it takes me four hours. So if you see like a, a you know 10 minute video from us and for every two minutes that you're watching it took me about two hours just to edit not to not to, don't not that's not including like writing and scripting and recording and all that stuff and so after that after like however many hours it takes me to edit a video uh which is usually like three to four days i uh make the thumbnail and uh usually the title is an afterthought and then I'll, I'll make the title and then and then I'll upload it. I usually make the thumbnail the day that we upload the video. And that's sort of the process. It takes about 10 to 11 days for a video. And uh, yeah, I recently, my friend was like begging me to teach him how to edit. And so he's kind of been my, my, um, my assistant editor. You know, I pay him to like do all the rough cutting and I pay him to do like uh, just simple stuff, like you know, organize, like doing the audio, making sure there's a compressor and nothing's clipping and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I I love those 
those pieces that Vox does. You know, that it's similar to like their Netflix show, Explained, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And one of their, I would love to get this guy on this show, but one of their former, he's now, I guess, a former video producer or videographer for them, Johnny Harris. That dude makes some incredible documentary style videos. He did, he did Borders on Vox, which he would travel to different parts of the world and then um, tell these stories or do reporting on these stories in these interesting countries that had unique or fascinating like border situations. And there was like a series on Vox for like a couple of years that he was doing. But, yeah, I love him. I, I, I love his videos. I, I'm subscribed to his channel. Oh, yeah. I, I watch his stuff for uh, inspiration all the time, and he's really good, man. Well, it looks... That's like, definitely it like lo- what we're aiming for. <laughs> yeah, no, it looks... I mean, honestly, like, I can kind of see the... the A bit of his work reflected in, in your work as well. I mean, this is... That's, that's why flattering. I'm... I'm sorry, what did you say? So that's very flattering. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's so impressive what you're able to do as essentially as like a one man, a one man band, you know, like like you said, you don't you have a friend who's kind of helping you sort through things. But when it comes to like the actual hard process of editing all of this, all of this stuff, it's it's really just you. And another thing, too, is just like the storytelling aspect to it as well like that's to me for me from like a writing perspective piecing together a narrative and framing all the different disparate parts into something that's cohesive and and tells like an actual story is one of the hardest parts of of creating content whether it is written or or video or even audio now with some of these audio podcast documentaries that you have i mean that's something that you're just doing essentially through trial and error, right? Like just practicing and seeing, okay, does this, does this idea fit here or should this idea maybe be a little bit later in the video? I think now it's, it's, there's like, there's literally a template, (laughs) like, because I've done it so many times. uh, I just know how it's going to go. Like I, there's all like, if I, if I hired you to be my writer, I, I, I could tell you, you know, like, all right, like, so there's not that much story behind this shoot. It doesn't have that much cultural relevance. So I need you to expand on, you know, like, on the the technical aspects of the shoe and branch off on the history of the brand instead of the shoe. Like, because, you know, like, like, for example, we recently did a video on the history of the VaporMax, and it's not a very old technology. Um, it's only been around for, like, three or four years. And that's what we did. We expanded on like its technological features, and uh, and we kind of had to just like beef up the the story or the script behind the. Uh, sometimes you can't even figure out like who designed the shoe, and it's very hard to tell a story about like a product when you don't have like any context. So there's a lot of shoes that like I've wanted to do, and I like there's a lot of Adidas shoes that I that there's just Adidas has no. For one, they don't have any kind of. I mean, they do, but they're not an American brand, right? So, but they don't have. They don't really have a lot of. Besides, like Run DMC, and like you know, '80s hip hop and stuff. They don't really have a lot of like big cultural um, moments in America. Definitely in Europe, for sure. Probably a bunch of stuff that I don't even know about. But it's like I wanted to do like a, a history of like the Adidas Samba or the Adidas Gazelle. And it's really challenging because there's not really that much history behind it. Like you could talk about the history of Adidas as a whole and there's, that's interesting. Uh, but like, I mean, it's literally just like a, you know, a suede shoe with the three stripes that was made for training. And, uh, and that's it. Like what, what, who designed it? I don't know. Like, uh, and what's the story behind the person who designed it? We don't know. Like it's, it's, it's really hard to, and I, and I, I find myself committing to shoes or brands for a video, you know, like we're going to do the history of this shoe. And then there's like no information on, there's no storytelling behind it. And you kind of just have to like, 
you almost have to be like it's almost like it's almost like gas supply on your car like you only have this much story and you've got to like take one block of the of this storytelling of the story that you have like and just expand it as much as you can like if you know who designed the shoe that's a good like 300 words you can be like you know John designed the Adidas Samba. John grew up in blah, 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 blah. He has experience in blah, 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 blah. And this is how you kind of expand on something as bland as like a shoe that... Uh, does, does this make any sense? Am I just rambling here? No, it makes sense to me, man. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's a... Uh, it's definitely... Um, it's definitely a challenge at times to, to, to weave in a story. But we figured it out. And now there's a process and, and we have tools to like, to make it happen as opposed to like before I would be scared to take on a project if there wasn't like a pre-existing like 20 page article on the internet about it that had like, you know, information or a good Wikipedia. Because uh, there's definitely um, shoes out there that are people want us to do and it's just like dude there's not enough information on that shoe like i don't know what to talk we get a lot of requests for the air max uh big window and uh it's a cool shoe but i just don't know <laughs> i don't know how i could make that into a story that's 10 minutes or seven minutes you know what i mean it'd be more like three minutes so you gotta like package it in a certain way like a history of like obscure nike shoes or something like that and then, then it's a story, you know what I mean? Does that, um, you know, you, you mentioned something interesting there in terms of time for a video. Like these, these documentary type pieces that you do are, they're, they're not short. They're not like two minutes or three minutes, like you said. They're a bit longer. Is that, was that like, uh, did that factor in your, your decision making to kind of, shift gears and go more of this like documentary style route because you knew you could create content that was longer for YouTube. Cause it seems like obviously like YouTube rewards, rewards creators who are creating content that's much longer rather than shorter. Yeah. Uh, that was definitely, it, you know, to be honest, like I, 10 minutes is too long for me because it's just like, so much work it's so much work to edit all this stuff and uh, i i want to make videos 22 minutes long but and i know it's like advantageous to do that for youtube because the algorithm likes longer videos or whatever but uh i've, I've actually tried to shave off minutes because it's just so much you know uh like if i could i'd make five minute videos <laughs> because it's just so much damn work and uh and, you know, I know people watch our videos and like at the four minute mark where we're talking about like uh, some kind of like technological feature of the shoe where it's boring. I know that. And I'll put like a, some kind of visual. To be honest, like if you watch our videos, there's like these sound effects in the uh, like whenever a title pops up and I, I do that and I leave it pretty loud. I do that to like keep the viewer like awake and interested. Like I'll pepper them out through the video to do the edit. Uh, because I know it gets bland. I know like, you know, technical features of a shoe. Like recently I was researching just for my own self, a, uh, a handheld like retro gaming, not like a Nintendo Switch, but like a, it's almost like a Switch, but it's just retro games. And I, I watched a lot of videos on it and man, I was like falling asleep watching it. They're talking about like the CPU, like people don't care about that, man. They want to know about like when Michael Jordan shot this shot or when uh, people were st mall stampedes for a shoe. They want to know, like, the story, you know? So, uh, yeah, I, for I totally forgot your question, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I was talking about watch time, but that makes sense, oh, though. Oh, yeah, watch uh, time, yeah. Honestly, that makes sense, because even coming from the... It would be interesting to challenge that, because I think, yes, like, YouTube does reward content that is longer but i i kind of look at it and it would be interesting to see if if anybody tries this out who ends up listening to this podcast but not necessarily being so concerned about length because if you 
if you prioritize the length of a video, right, you're, you might just end up putting filler material in there that doesn't add anything to, to the content of the video. It's just, you're just trying to hit a certain mark, right? Rather than actually, like you're saying, focusing on these elements that can, that can really engage the person that's watching the video and keep them glued regardless of whether it's it's longer or or shorter or not i think that that's it's more important to focus on that rather than just um thinking so much about am i making a 15 minute video because if i have a 15 minute video then youtube's going to reward me more so than somebody who made a 5 minute video cuz like you said yeah, any, i think any, any, anybody who 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 prioritizes like YouTube analytics or like, you know, trying to meet like a certain minute, like, oh, my, my video has to be like 11 minutes and eight seconds because that's like prime for monetization or something like that and doesn't consider like their audience, like they're not going to get very far on the platform and they're not going to really have a real community because uh, that's just a bad idea. Like you always got to consider like the person who's watching the video if you want to, um, I think, Personally, if you want if you want to grow on YouTube, if you want to succeed and make a real connection with people, which is the whole point of YouTube, you know, for me, at least it's just a community. Like you got to listen to your uh, to your audience members, um, and you got to sometimes you got to like decide what's best for them, even though they don't know it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they might be like, "Yo, I want a twenty minute video." I was like, "No, you don't, dude." Like if I start talking about like this shit for 20 minutes you're gonna like tap out and you're gonna hate us like you want like you're excited about this and this this like I, I know I pay a lot of attention to the comments and uh and yeah can yeah you, you should never go into making a video um just to try to like hack the uh, algorithm or something like that you know what I mean that's a bad idea yeah, I, I think the I mean, the algorithm is just based on like actual user behavior on like the actual person who is who is watching the video. So you have to there is an element, I think, and it's very hard for any kind of video creator to to balance or juggle. This is is um, paying attention to the analytics, but then also still keeping paying attention to the creative aspect and the more like qualitative, I guess, elements of, of creating content. Cause like you said, there's some stuff that, you know, um, there are people might be out there that are creating, creating videos and all they're doing is just thinking about the algorithm and it just ends up, it ends up being like very cookie cutter, like everything else out there. And it doesn't really like wow you. And I think in order to, to, to stand out from the rest of the crowd. Sometimes you have to like diverge a little bit, you know, use it as a baseline maybe, but not necessarily um, feel like you're a slave to the algorithm for the most part. I agree. Yeah, I agree, man. hundred percent. So I'm, I'm, I want to know about the early days of your channel, you know, or for, for Nacho average finds, like you guys are at are almost around a hundred thousand subscribers at this point. Um, what, what were those early days like in terms of promoting the content? Like at, when you guys got to get, getting from like zero to your first 10,000 subscribers, like how did you guys, how did you guys go about getting the word out on your videos? Uh, for, uh, first it was, um, well, okay. So when you first start YouTube, and when anybody will tell you this, who's done YouTube and have stuck with it, like every little comment, every little view really matters. Right. Uh, especially when you're first starting out, like we would get like 90 views on a video or we would get over a hundred and we'd be, we'd like be pumped. We wouldn't celebrate it, but we would definitely be like, damn dude, we got 200 views on a video. Like, Oh my God. And we finally like got a comment and like YouTube lets you know through email, you know, so you're at work and you get an email, like somebody left a comment. Like, oh, great video. And that does, that's what early days of YouTube were like. Like, don't, if anybody's getting into YouTube, uh, don't expect like a bunch of comments at first or a bunch of views. Like, it's gonna be very, very slow. 
and that's kind of what those early days were like for us and um, but you stick to it right you stick to it and and for me one comment is worth it 500 views is worth it like 500 views was a lot of views for us at some point you know and um, and we would we would be very happy with that I remember when we had like 2,000 subscribers I was like damn this is dope like I'm, I feel accomplished already with 2,000 subscribers and we had like you know our our um, our diehard fans who would like message us and DM us on Instagram and the early days were the best it was the best and you were always trying stuff now I'm kind of like now we're, we kind of have this niche that we kind of have to stick to we, I think we're gonna pivot a little bit into other kinds of videos but right now like you know people are subscribing to us for a certain reason and that's for sneaker history right but we're gonna make other kind of videos very soon and uh, the way we went from a thousand to ten thousand was through that champion video that I was telling you about it was a uh, it, it was funny it was like Christmas Eve I'm Mexican American and my uh, my family celebrates Christmas on Christmas Eve and we uh, we have like a big party and our family gets together and we celebrate until midnight and once it's midnight like we open all our presents or whatever it's all that's always been our tradition and we're, me and my brother were hanging out and uh, it's fun. this is crazy it's on Christmas man suddenly like I were like phones blowing up and we're looking and that champion video that I uploaded seven months ago or something crazy like that suddenly went from like having 700 views to like 400,000 and uh, over the course of like the next over it by the time it was like January or February we had already had like we had like 11,000 14,000 subscribers just off the success of that video and uh, we replicated that several times throughout, you know, since then, we've gone viral several times with those videos, those history videos, and that's how, that's how we've been able to grow. You know what I mean? So you notice a trend, essentially, like when that, when that video went really viral, it's like, okay, it seems like people, they do want these kinds of videos, so let's maybe like double down a little bit and try producing more of these 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 narrative documentary style type content it was definitely more it was definitely that but it was also more of like a to be honest like i was scared when that happened because i was like damn i made that video by myself my brother didn't even help me with that video like and and this is about me and my brother like this is this is born out of like love for my brother and i, I want to do this to my brother like i don't want this to be just me so we still did the Ross Finds videos. So we, we did that video, and then after that, we would do a Ross Finds video, then we would do a Sneaker History video, then a Ross Finds video, then Sneaker History. And it and the, the Ross Finds videos just weren't getting love. And uh, and it was just like, all right, you know, we gotta make like a business kind of decision to just do Sneaker History, because that's what works, and that's what people want, and that's why people are subscribing to us, so. But at first, no, it wasn't that apparent. It was. It was it was a que it was like in in question like man you know like we should just do this cuz you know this went viral but at the same time it, it wasn't like a uh, like we knew like oh shit we went viral we got to double down on this it wasn't like that it was more of like a slow realization and a slow acceptance like okay we've pigeonholed ourselves here <laughs> <laughs> we've we, we've got to do this and uh and that's what that's what's been our that's our MO, you know, sneaker history. That's our niche. There's nobody else on YouTube doing this at this level in our niche. And, uh, and I think even if we, if we stop doing it right now, I think we've covered most of the iconic shoes in, um, in at least Nike's catalog and Jordan and all the shoes that matter in culture and if, even if we go to, we stop doing sneaker history videos and we just do like reviews of shoes like most sneaker YouTubers do and we go back to vlogs, like I, I, I'm very proud of what we've done. We, like I'm super happy with the subscribers we have and uh, I, I feel like mission's been accomplished a long time ago for us in terms of like 
fulfilling the, uh, you know, fulfilling the, the goals that we had coming into it. Like, this is what we wanted to do. After, after realizing like, yo, sneaker history videos work, it was more of like a damn, uh, why do they work? And why are we doing it? And you start asking yourself this question, it's like to educate people and, um, and to tell stories. It's not, you know, like, I love shoes and, um, and learning the history behind the shoe, like just intensifies your love for the shoe and uh, validates <laughs> you buying the shoe, you know? If, so, if you want to think about it that way, like I get so many people who comment and they say like, man, I'm going to go buy this shoe right now. Or damn, I just bought this shoe or damn. Now I love my shoe even more. Like I didn't know that. I didn't know I'm wearing a piece of history and that's kind of been the mission. And I feel like that mission has been accomplished and we're getting ready to pivot into something else real soon. So yeah, that's cool, man. I mean, yeah, that that's, uh, from a, from a marketing standpoint, like someone who, if it's me who works in marketing, like that is something, if I were working at Nike or Adidas, if you sent that to me <laughs> and you sent me a screenshot of a comment on your YouTube video that got like a hundred thousand views or whatever, somebody saying, I'm going to buy this shoe now, that would make me pause and think, oh, maybe I should consider investing in this channel in some way or collaborating with them in some way because that that's ultimately like the goal of that product or brand to to sell something um i have i have i have a folder of those comments like i screenshot them all the time yeah and i i, I put it in a press kit like we made i mean a media kit and uh to be honest i haven't reached out to nike or adidas or anybody i reached out to um like Rejuvenator, like some shoe cleaners. Uh, but I haven't reached out to any of the big brands. Just because I feel like, I don't know, we're, we're already doing, like for them to pay us, like I, we're already doing it for free, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I don't think Nike or Adidas or New Balance or whoever would pay us to make these videos when we're already making them anyway. You know what I mean? None of them have reached out. But I'd be thrilled to do it if they did reach out. But, you know, we, we're kind of already doing it for free almost um but i totally understand what you mean like as a marketer that's what you would want to see right <laughs> it would be cool you know it'd be cool if we could get like these shoes in our hands like and we could actually like show it in the video as opposed to having to like go on the internet and look for pictures of the shoe or videos of the shoe because uh it would be dope if we could like actually have the product and shoot be shoot our own b-roll of the product you know what i mean yeah i i honestly brian i think that they would pay you because if you think about it these companies already have huge marketing budgets that they're spending on advertising agencies agencies to create advertising campaigns for them right but they're not necessarily they some of those some of those content don't necessarily hit whereas you if you come to them you you're not going to necessarily ask for as much as the big agencies that they work with to do a video right like like you're saying at minimum you're thinking could they just give us some some product i think they would be happy to do that at minimum but i think that they would pay you as well because that's a service like to create to create this content and again i get it like they're like your reservations about you know, well, we're already doing it essentially for free and for ourselves. Um, again, brands would, they would pay for that. They would pay for that knowing that again, that it's, it's just, um, it would probably be an economical thing for them to do within their budget to like try and try and test it out. Right. Versus, paying for what they what they're already paying for as is in terms of like content and whatnot so i don't know if that makes any well, sense but i really do no, think that they would well hey if anybody from nike's watching you can the email is i mean that's how you got a hold of me so yeah i think that's Links part of it but that but see a part of it too is just like pitching you know it's like you have to find that contact because 
they just don't they may just not know about you yet like you know even though you have this this huge subscriber base of like almost a hundred thousand um subscribers on your youtube channel you know the internet is like limitless so it's really possible to reach that many people but maybe there are people there are just people at nike who haven't who haven't seen this yet or adidas or other companies that they just haven't seen your stuff yet and if you get if you send them if you can find somebody's email and and send them a pitch um kind of presenting the like the value that you can bring I think they would say yes because they you, like you just see the quality of like your videos and what you guys are making. It's clear that like there's a lot of thought that goes into this. Um, yeah, I, th I think you're right. And and I'm, to be honest, like I'm terrible at like I just it's like the bane of my existence to like network and go on Twitter and like look for people who work at Nike and like email them and and do all kinds of that kind of work. And uh, I, like I said, I'm a creative person and I'm just going to right now, like we've got plans to, 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 to make it like the, the, we we're. I feel like we'll have more leverage if they reach out to us, you know? And, uh, and again, I'm not worried about making money off these brands right now. Um, I'm just worried about like growing and making sure we're bringing value to the subscribers and um i just pff, i hate it dude i hate like reaching out and being like yo and like you know what this like sales pitch and i just it's not my thing uh it's not my brother's thing either <laughs> so but if you know you're definitely right i've had so many friends try to like be like dude you gotta you gotta email nike and you gotta you know do this and do that it's, and you're 100 percent right it's really just, to, to be honest, it's really about like changing your perspective on sales. Like when if you're thinking about it from this perspective, like I got to close them, I got to convince them like then you're it's not going to be an enjoyable process. Kind of going back to what we were talking about in the beginning of embracing or the process of of doing things. I kind of look at like marketing in the same way um, in the sense that, you know, you you throw out an idea, you pitch it out there to to somebody and they either say yes or no. It's very similar to like when I reached out to you to do this show. I mean, you could basically like take my pitch and then kind of adapt it to your to your pitch to some of these companies. I mean, I don't know if you noticed some of the elements of it, but like I did legit share your show with like a friend of mine who works for the NBA. I used to work in the NBA myself. Um, who works in social media. He's like the digital marketing director or digital content director for the Minnesota Timberwolves. I don't know if that had any like impact on you when you thought, oh, okay, this guy seems interesting. Maybe we might want to do this. But um, I think the reason, to, to, just to like, just because it's fun, like the reason I said yes to, to your thing, um, I mean, I looked at the, the, um, <laughs> the, the copy like that you wrote me and uh, it was very genuine, you know. And I was just like, you know, like I get we get asked a lot to be on podcasts and to like do certain things or m mostly like brand like small brands that want us to do like to place their products in our videos or whatever. But I was like, this is, you know, this guy seems legit and he seems nice. So yeah, it was it was definitely different than all the other emails that I usually get. So that's why. Um, I said, yeah, to doing it. Uh, it just seemed like a cool idea to me. And also, uh, I, like, after I got your email, I started getting Instagram ads and Facebook ads for Video Husky. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw one, and I was like, oh, this is kind of legit. Like, they're actually spending money, like, on, make, on ads. Like, okay, all right, I'll do it. You know, we'll see. This should, it's going to be fun. Yeah. Well, so, I, I that, appreciate that's, that, that's man. That's why I said yes. Yeah. I appreciate that, man, because that was that was definitely something in there. For every person that I've pitched for for this to do this podcast, this first run of this podcast, I've I like legit have watched their videos. Like I I like your channel. I, I you know I'm not a huge sneakerhead myself. I just love 
basketball again having worked in the league myself but um who's your team well i used i i used to work for the sacramento kings but oh, cool man yeah, yeah that's uh it's not been good like honestly i started working there the first year they missed the playoffs so i don't know if that's an that says something about me or is that that's m- more to do with them maybe it's half and half <laughs> but uh um, they're underrated they're they've they're, they you know they're they're in the cycle and, and it's only a matter of time before yeah. they, they get their shine they're you know they're having all that mix up of um management right now right yeah like the front office is being changed and i like the sacramento kings i like watching them play yeah and, you know mike bibby's a huge sneakerhead. oh yeah but see that's another thing like there's opportunity i think even with collaborating with teams like 100 percent, i would i would connect you with like my my friends who still work in the nba imagine going to like De'Aaron fox's house and going through his his kicks collection with him right or that's the goal like those are the kind of videos i want to make you guys can do that 100 percent. and i think it kind of goes back to what i'm saying just like reaching out pitching the way very similar to the way that i pitched you to come on this podcast but then accepting that okay i could throw this out there um these are the terms of the deal that i'm throwing out and then if they're interested you know great if they're not i've I've pitched some other people to, to work with too. So it's, I, I just think there's like a lot of, I like your friends. I do think that there's like a ton of opportunity because this is around your, your content is around like a product that people buy. <laughs> and so if you're, if you're creating content around stuff that has like buying, that has like a buying angle to it, then there's definitely like chances to, to monetize and, and and turn it into um you know like a full a full-time income for yourself but yeah i I agree i think uh yeah and i've been through it too in the past i've you know i've i've i know where you're at as well like in terms of creating content and not wanting to be focused more on the creative side of things and not not really you know feeling like dealing with the business aspects of it can can kind of take away from that um, but who knows you have an, like you said, you have an obsessive personality. Maybe you catch the bug and like, or like, you know, just start to feel, Hey man, maybe I should, I, I want to learn more about like how, how to go and reach out to, to people for, for marketing deals or, or brand deals and whatnot. And once you crack, once you crack that code, like the sky's the limit, I think for your for channel, sure. uh, I love people, man. So I love, I love talking to people and, uh, I feel like uh, I'll pop. I mean, we actually already have a podcast in the works too. So I think pot doing podcasts with with certain people in the industry is gonna is gonna be that reaching out without. Oh yeah, you know, you know, being that like writing that email or whatever. So yeah, you just wanna. Uh, I think with with pitching or just trying to collaborate with people, you like I said, the big aspect of it is just accepting that they'll say no like if there's a high probability that like you pitch somebody maybe a brand deal or you pitch them to be on your podcast or you pitch them an opportunity to do a video with them and they'll just say no and that's okay because there's other there's other opportunities out there um to collaborate with other people so once you have that once you like take that weight off of your shoulder of like feeling all right i have to land this land this opportunity i have to land this deal then it just becomes essentially like a numbers game you know it's definitely not a wait for me it's not i'm not scared if somebody say no it's more of just like a damn i don't even want i i just want to work on that video yeah well it takes so much time like what you guys are doing it's it's like it's very time consuming the kind of quality of videos that you guys are creating Uh, for sure so for sure i want to ask you also about um balancing a day job with doing this how do you how how what's your approach to that like do you do you try to like do work on this in the mornings before you start working on your day job responsibilities or do you do it later in the day or is it kind of um just whenever you find time uh well i think 
like most people who, uh, like a, a lot of people who still have a job, I think COVID has kind of been a blessing in a way because I, now I'm only working three days a week when I was working five before, right? Um, and I have more time to work on this kind of thing. So right now, the current, um, the current way I balance this is I, I, on the days I work, I, I look at those as kind of like almost like off days in my head. Like, um, so going to work is really easy for me. It's like, it's a, it's an easy job. I work at a hotel and it's kind of, I could do it with my eyes closed. Um, it's not really a mental strain really. And I enjoy it. And it's kind of like a day off for me. And then on the days that I'm off, it's like, you know, you got to hit the ground running on the YouTube thing. So I don't do any kind of work unless I really, really have to. I don't do any kind of YouTube work before I go to work or after either. You know, I get home pretty late at night and I just, I just chill. I watch, you know, a YouTube video or I um, scroll on social media or whatever, but I don't. I, the days I work are the days I work and I'm just a normal person on those days. And then when I'm off, it's more of like, all right, now you got to do this YouTube thing. And then I'll reward myself. Like, okay, if you can finish like, i like this week, I have, to, I have today off, which is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And if I can finish all my work on Wednesday, I'll take all of Thursday off to myself to do whatever I want. Right like play video games or I like to do photography, I'll go take photos or I'll cook or I'll, I'll do whatever. Um, and uh, so it's a little extreme in that way. But um, yeah, so I really don't have time, days, day, real days off. Because sometimes I won't, I won't, re I won't get to that reward, you know, like I, like we were talking about before, like getting started is hard, right? And I'll get backed up and then by the time it's Thursday, you know, I got work on Friday and I got to finish this video. So there was no, there was no real day off where I just took time to myself. It's just more just like, okay, I go to my day job. That's like I was saying, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll do my day job and then, um, and I take my day job you know, as serious as I can on those days. And then the days that I'm off, it's like a hundred percent YouTube. And if I can get my work done early, I'll, I'll really take a day off like for real and chill out. Um, but almost every single day I walk for an hour a day and that's huge for, um, keeping the stress levels down. If I don't walk, like, like we've been having a lot of fires in LA and the air quality is bad. And if I can't go for a walk, like I really start to get out of, I start to get really out of uh, shape mentally and uh, and I start to like really lose progress. You know what I mean? So definitely you got to exercise, man. Yeah. If you're trying to balance, if you're trying to balance YouTube and, and a day job, you got to have some exercise or something to cope with the stress because it's very stressful, especially right. Like I said, right now I'm working three days, but imagine working five days and trying to do these videos. So, Gotcha. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think anybody who's looking for balance, balance, uh, should needs to needs to do some exercise to keep stress levels down, and uh, and they gotta really love what they're doing, because there really is no for me there is no balance. There's no, it's just always it's a, there's always a process. You're always thinking about stuff, and there's no um, there's no such thing as work life balance. Yeah, especially especially these yeah. days when <laughs> with COVID and whatnot, you know, yeah, pandemic life where um, those lines have been blurred for so many people where you're you're now working from home and you're still at home. So I, I personally have been working remotely for the last few years. So shifting when I saw the whole world shifting this way, it, it really wasn't it obviously wasn't a big change for me or a big adjustment for me um but i could understand especially looking back like the early days of remote working like how important it is to to learn how to be disciplined and 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 have a structure to the way you do things um 
that's why I tend to like to do all, all of my creative work like in the morning. That's usually when I'm most fresh. And then I'll, I'll I'll do some I'll do like more of the the less thought intensive stuff later in the day. Oh, I also take ten minute naps. For what it's worth, like it really helps, man. Even if you don't sleep, just close your eyes for ten minutes, and uh, it's like you get a whole second half of a whole another. Um, you get a whole another like. It's like you get yeah you get, you extend your your day by another half. For me, I'm learning like if you can be disciplined and you can take a uh, a ten minute nap, like it, it can really help in terms of like energy levels. You know what I mean? Because everybody has a hump. I think. Uh, I, I don't know if you do, but like around like three o'clock, I'm like, I'm like sleepy, man. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta like walk away from the computer, and. Uh, I mean, I, I, I recently was dealing with like eye strain, like my eye would twitch pretty badly. Like it, I had to like just not look at computer screens or, or my phone. And uh, I was even using like these blue light glasses because my, I was just working so much. Uh, but you get definitely got to, I think taking naps will help, um, for, at least for me. Take a 10 minute nap and... And you'll be able to work another four hours or another two hours at least um, in terms of like the regular f four hours that you do in the morning. Because sometimes for me, like those first four hours, that's it. I'll have the rest of the day to do work and those first four hours of like intense focus, like that's as far as I'm getting. Even if I, Even if I sit there for another four hours, like I won't get... I won't get that much work done because my mind is just like, I don't know. Do, do, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. Yeah. You got to have, you got to have moments where you like refresh, take a, take a moment to kind of refresh yourself. Yeah. No, that makes total sense to me. Um, I, I wanted to also ask you about being on camera. Cause that was something, you know, you had mentioned, you know, you, you started this channel and then started the other channel with your brother. You, you kind of deferred yourself from the spotlight, <laughs> right? Like you, you let your, your, your brothers kind of take most of the, the shine in terms of being on camera. But then as you started to do more of these like documentary type pieces, I noticed it was interesting that you went from just doing voiceovers for them to then, having yourself like appear on 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 screen and 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 narrate them as well like what there's like two questions i have related to that like what was the what was the thought process behind shifting away from just doing voiceovers only and then into doing into being on camera and then just touch a little bit on how you've um, just worked on your on-camera presence or what that was even like in the very beginning? That was definitely a conscious decision. Like, it, it was very hard um, to, to, to put myself in front of the camera. Like, I was super shy about it. Uh, and believe it or not, uh, some of the, the comments I got, like, on our first viral video with my um, voiceover where I wasn't showing my face, people were like, commenting like crazy shit like dude your voice is so bad like <laughs> it's so monotone like i want to fall asleep like oh like i think like the top comment on one of the videos was like watch this at like 1.5 uh speed thank me later or something like that because my voice was just so monotone and i was like talking into like i have a music background right so i was i had like a really expensive microphone and i had it like real close so it was like a really uh, closed up mic and I had like very low energy <laughs> and I had to study like I had to go off and study like Vox videos again and I noticed when they talk their 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 voices go up and down like they go like in 1977 when don't and it, it just like it goes Ooh, like the pitches change like music right and I wasn't doing that I was literally just like one note all the way through so I had to try challenge I had to train myself to like do these voiceovers Anyways, uh, 
at some point I thought to myself like, damn, we got to like, we're trying to build a brand here, like a personal brand, not just like, I don't want like people's relationship with our channel to just be a logo or a color. We definitely got to show our faces from now on. So that's, that's why I started making videos with myself and my brother on camera because I wanted to like be able to, um, to still keep it like, yo, you're hearing this from a friend, you know, like this is candor from a friend. This isn't, this isn't Vox. This isn't uh, Bloomberg or some like, you know, corporation. This is like, you know, two dudes, two brothers. And I, I, and I thought it was important to show our face. So as much as I was bad at it at first, and as much as like it was difficult for me, it wasn't difficult for my brother at all. He's like very confident on camera. It, uh, it was totally worth it. How long did it take you to kind of feel more comfortable on camera? If there, if, or if you still, I imagine probably there's still points where you're, you're like still a little nervous too though, right? No, I don't even care anymore. Oh, okay. I dude, I'll, I'll, I'll like, it doesn't even bother me anymore. Um, but it took me like two videos. Okay, how many takes? How many takes in those two videos? Then were you doing? <laughs> uh, so usually our scripts are like four pa Like you know, let me see if I have one around. Oh no. Anyways, um, usually like I have. So this is how it works. So I I script in when I'm going to be on camera. So uh, because the videos are so scripted, like I'll highlight when I'm going to be on camera. So usually like let's say this is the shot. For the video, I'll, I'll like, I'll be like, I'll have the script in front of my face, and I'll be like, in 1988, so and so shoe was released, you know, at the height of blah 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 blah, and that's the script, and then I'll know that okay, right here, I want to say something. I'll be like, hey, did you guys have this shoe at some point in your life? Um, please, you know, let me know what it was like. Leave a comment down below, right? And then I'll just do that a couple of times, and then. Um, I'll have my assistant editor uh, just take the very last take of that, of that, and then that's what we'll use every time. So I don't even before when I first started, yeah, I would definitely take a lot of takes, but now I sometimes I everything is just one take because I'm not a perfectionist about it anymore, and I don't care. And uh, and, and anybody who who's starting to be on camera will. will soon realize that it really doesn't matter. Like nobody cares. Just, you just gotta do it, you know? Don't worry about the lighting so much. You know, before I would like obsess over it. <laughs> it doesn't really matter that much. Make sure the audio is good. That's for sure. That's the number one thing, right? <laughs> Make sure the audio is good and the, the camera's rolling. Yeah. Um, I guess one of the last things I wanna ask you about as we start to wrap up here is related to something you brought up there is is the scripting of these videos um and i noticed that in watching your videos you have moments where you have you drop in like little calls to action right you'll you talk to the audience you ask them what they think about something in particular that you brought up in the video um can you walk me through how it is that you you script your videos to make sure that they get people to engage with the content that you're creating uh it's definitely an afterthought it's not something that's baked into our scripts it's more of like a uh, it's 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 really organic the way it happens right it's not like oh okay i need to have three call to actions in this video like i said anytime you're at least my personal opinion anytime you're like you're very like I'm, it's, it's, we're not, there's no like, okay, we need four calls to action in this. It's more of like, a, okay, there's definitely an intro where you say, hi, my name's Brian, welcome to the channel, consider subscribing, we make sneaker content, blah, 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 blah. You gotta have that, right? Just so that people know what they're about to watch. But other than that, it's more just like, based off like what, what's in the script. Like if, you know, if I'm reading about like, if I'm talking about like the Air Jordan 11, and we're in the part of a script where, uh, you know, I'm talking about like when somebody got jumped for their Jordans or something like that. I'll be like, yo, did, has any of you guys ever been jumped by uh, by somebody for your Jordans? Like, has that ever happened to you? Uh, you know, leave your story down below. 
and it's really organic in that way or it's or or i'm literally curious to know like sometimes i'll be like researching a script and i'll be like i'll be thinking to myself like damn i i, I wish i had more information about this particular um part of this sneaker and i'd be like yo um i know a lot of people say they they twist their ankles wearing the vapor max uh I've never owned a pair of Vapor Max myself, but have you guys ever? Has anybody ever rolled it? I, I'm curious to know. Leave a comment down below, and I get I get insight that way. And I also have a Facebook group of sneaker people, and I ask them the same things. Like whenever I uh, something comes up in the script or during research, like, and I want to like learn more about something, and I can't find enough research, I'll just ask the audience. And if there's like gray areas in the script, that's a great time to to ask your audience like for help or just for their own insight, you know? Like, you know, does that make sense? Like, it'll, those those call to actions just come naturally for us, at least, for, for our kind of videos. Are, are you, so it sounds like to me, you're you're just kind of like improvising it. Like, do you, is that yeah, what happens? 100%. Like, you're kind of just reading the script and then the thought comes into your mind, like, has this ever happened to you? Like, have you gotten jumped for, you know, for your, your Jordan sneakers or something like that? Sometimes it's that. And then sometimes it's, sometimes I'm writing the script. And I'm like, Ooh, I want to ask them about that. You know, like, is it, you know, like, yo, 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 all the, uh, you know, OG sneakerheads who were around in the eighties. Is it true that the soul was a little bit bigger than it is today? Like, what was that like? Leave us a comment, that kind of thing. Okay, so it comes up in the script writing process too, where you're writing it and then you get curious about something and and want to ask the audience about it. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Cool, you, you know, was this shoe is, is as comfortable as they marketed it? Like, I've never tried on a pair. Or do you think this is the most comfortable shoe? Or what's the most comfortable shoe you've ever owned? Like that kind of stuff. Gotcha. And I, I'm like genuinely, we're genuinely curious to know. Like, it's not like a, yo. Leave a comment so that we get a lot of comments and our video is going to get a ton of views now. It's yeah. It's never that. It's yeah. never that. Sometimes it's like a, it's a, every, every call to action is, is to benefit the viewer for a hundred percent, you know, even when I'm like, yo, we just launched a podcast, go listen to this podcast. Like I wouldn't be pitching that unless it was a cool podcast or something I believed in. Or like, yo, we just started this this uh, Facebook group. I think you're gonna enjoy it. Like, I genuinely think you're gonna enjoy it. Like, it's it's more like a recommendation from a friend, as opposed of like a call out from a YouTuber or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, you're 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 just trying to help them out, help the audience out with something, or just try to foster a little bit more of a community connection with them. It sounds like. Um, so I guess, yeah, to wrap things up on on my end, um, is there anything else that you want to touch on? Um, I, you've mentioned here that you have, you you guys launched a, a new podcast. Do you want to tell people about that? Um, and um, Yeah, so we're going to do a podcast really soon. It's called Sneaker Enthusiast, which is the same name as our Facebook group. It's called Sneaker Enthusiast. Uh, we're, we are going to cap the Facebook group at 5,000 members because we want to keep it small and we want to keep it engaged. A lot of Facebook groups get too big and it just it has no life and it, they're very hard to moderate after a while. Uh, but that's going to be the name of the podcast. It's going to be called Sneaker Enthusiast and we're going to interview people just like this one. People in the industry, we're going to talk sneakers. Uh, it's going to be a good time. Uh, but yeah, you could... Definitely be on the lookout for that in the future. And uh, in terms of other things going on for us, we're just going to keep keep putting out content. And um, hopefully real soon we'll be able to make this a full-time living and we'll be able to make more videos for people, you know, because it's as it's, it's, it's much work as it is, it's super rewarding. Gotcha. Well, that's cool, man. Um. Yeah, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, John. 
Thank you, man. This is great. Thanks again to Brian Maderos for coming on the show. If you want to connect with Brian, you want to follow his channel, you want to follow Nacho Average Finds, find them on YouTube. Uh, we've got links to his YouTube channel in the podcast show notes as well as the YouTube description if you're watching the video down below. And if you enjoyed this show, make sure to leave a review wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. And subscribe to our email list. It's the easiest way to stay up to date for whenever we release new episodes of the Video Craft Show or we create new content for the YouTube channel. So until next time, we'll see you then. Yeah.